When the era of bird and magic came to a close, the league needed a new face, and that face was Michael Jordan. MJ started his basketball career playing high school ball at Emsley A. Laney High School. Jordan tried out for the varsity team in his sophomore season, but due to him being only 5'11", he was forced to stay in JV. Motivated to improve and having grown 4 inches over the summer, Jordan made the varsity team and averaged 25 points per game for his junior and senior seasons. Jordan received many scholarship offers for his high school play, and he eventually settled with North Carolina University. As a freshman for the Tar Heels, Jordan averaged 13.4 points on 53.4% shooting. He won Freshman of the Year and won an NCAA championship after hitting a game-winning mid-range jumper versus the Patrick Ewing-led Georgetown Hoyas. This iconic shot would be the turning point of Jordan's career, where he got the world's attention as basketball's next big thing. He averaged 20 points and 5 rebounds for his sophomore and junior seasons, shooting 54% from the field. He won the Naismith and Wooden College Player of the Year awards, and he would skip his senior season to declare for the NBA draft, where he was taken third overall by the Chicago Bulls, with Hakeem Olajuwon and bust Sam Bowie going over him. Jordan was one of the best rookies of all time in his first season with the Bulls, averaging 28 points, 6.5 rebounds, 6 assists, and 2.5 steals on 51.5% shooting. He was an all-star, and he brought the Bulls to their first playoff appearance in four years, despite a losing record. But they lost to the defensive juggernaut Milwaukee Bucks in the first round. In his second season, MJ would suffer the only major injury of his career. He broke his foot in the third game of the season, he would miss 64 games, the Bulls managed would try to convince MJ to sit out for the rest of the season so that the team could get a high draft pick, but MJ accused them of trying to tank and they let him play for the remaining 15 games of the season, and Jordan struggled, only averaging 22 points per game, doing so shooting 45% from the field, and the Bulls narrowly made the playoffs with the fifth worst record to make the playoffs in NBA history, with a 30-52 and record. The Bulls would face the 87 Celtics, often considered one of the greatest teams ever, and Jordan would famously score 63 on the Celtics in Game 2, but the Bulls would still lose in a sweep. Next season, Jordan would become the only guard to score 3,000 points in one season, and be only the second player to ever do it behind Wilt Chamberlain. He averaged an absurd 37 points per game, along with 5 rebounds, 4.5 assists, 3 steals, and 1.5 blocks on 58% shooting from the field. Jordan did this on a team whose second best player was Charles Oakley, who was averaging a double-double on worst field goal percentage than Jordan despite being a big man. Jordan was on a really bad team, but he was so dominant that that team was at 500. But a team built entirely around one guy wouldn't beat a team with a lot of depth, which is why the Boston Celtics would sweep the Bulls once again. This pattern would carry over for MJ. He had more seasons of insane individual accomplishment followed by disappointment in the playoffs because of a lack of help on his roster. In the 87-88 season, he'd put up 35 points 
points, 5.5 rebounds, 6 assists, 3.2 steals, and 1.5 blocks on 53% shooting. MJ would win his first MVP and also take home Defensive Player of the Year, making him one of 5 guards to ever win Defensive Player of the Year, and making him one of 4 players to win both MVP and Defensive Player of the Year in their career. The Bulls, who won 50 games that year off of Jordan's performance, would beat the Cleveland Cavaliers in the first round, but they would lose to the Detroit Pistons in the second round. The Pistons, who had built a defensive game plan around MJ called the Jordan Rules. That plan was pretty much knock him to the ground. Woolrich set the pick. Jordan lost. Billy Johnson and Every. And a guard. Now look at the triple team as Sally and Rodman collapsed on Jordan. Damn. Rodman and Jordan this time. Walking foul, Dennis Rodman. Time. The pattern continued for the following season. MJ put up 33-8-8 on 54% shooting. The Bulls would make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, beating the Cavaliers in an infamous series. Sellers has Jordan. Jordan with two seconds to go. Puts it up. It's good! At the buzzer! Michael Jordan has won it for Chicago! and beating the Knicks. But Jordan and the Bulls would once again fall to the Detroit Pistons. Next season was the first year that Jordan had some real help. Scottie Pippen, who the Bulls had traded for in the 87 draft, was developing nicely and made the first all-star appearance of his career, averaging 16, 7, 5, and 2.5 and steals and 1.2 blocks on 48% shooting. And Horace Grant, who the Bulls also picked up in 87, averaged 13 and 8.5 and rebounds on 55% shooting. And the Bulls brought in head coach Phil Jackson, who introduced the triangle offense that the Bulls would see a lot of success with. The Bulls were the best they'd been winning 55 games, Jordan won the scoring title for the fifth year in a row, and the Bulls made it to the Eastern Conference Finals again to face none other than the Detroit Pistons, but they would lose in a seven game series, losing to the Pistons for the third consecutive season. With all this losing in the playoffs and the league still being very much big men oriented, many did not believe you could win with a guard, i.e. Jordan, as your best player. But Jordan and the Bulls proved that all wrong in the 91 season. Jordan won his second MVP, the Bulls won 61 games, the Bulls beat the Knicks and Sixers in the first two rounds of the playoffs, they advanced to the Eastern Conference Finals to face the Pistons for the last time, and the Bulls dominated, beating the Pistons in a sweep. Jordan averaged 35, 7, 2.5 steals and 2 blocks on 54% shooting. Scotty also dominated with 22, 8, 5, 3, and 2. The Pistons walked off of the court in Game 4 before the game was even over, without shaking the hands of a single Bulls player. Jordan had passed this obstacle in his career. The Bulls would face the Magic Johnson Lakers in the finals, and while they did not have Kareem anymore, they were still a very good team. Magic was still in his prime, he averaged 19, 8, and 12 for the series, and Vlad Divock, Sam Perkins, and James Worthy all averaged high teens in points for the series. The series was only five games, but a lot of the games were fairly close. Jordan averaged 31 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 11.5 assists, 2.8 steals, and 1.4 blocks on 56% shooting, absolutely stuffing the stat sheet. Jordan would win his first championship and finals MVP. This was the beginning of the first three-peat. Next season, MJ averaged 36 and 6. Scottie Pippen stepped up his game further, averaging 21, 8, 7, 2, and 1, and the Bulls made it to the finals to face the Portland Trailblazers who were led by Clyde Drexler and Terry Porter. Before the finals started, the media started to spin a story about Clyde being a better player than MJ simply because he was a far superior three-point shooter. Because the rivalry of Magic and Bird was gone, with Magic retiring due to HIV and Bird having injury problems, the media wanted to create a new rivalry between MJ and Clyde, but MJ would quickly destroy any idea of a rivalry and destroy the criticism of his three-point shot, saying that the reason that Clyde is a better three-point shooter is because he chooses not to be a better shooter. And he backed up that talk in Game 1, where Jordan scored an NBA Finals record 35 points in the first half. MJ did this by knocking down an NBA Finals record 6 threes in the first half. He would average 36 for the series on 53% shooting, with Clyde only averaging 25 a game on 40% shooting. The Bulls won in 6 games and a 
of course, MJ walked away with the finals MVP. Next season, MJ would not repeat his MVP with the award going to Charles Barkley, which was unfortunate for Charles because Jordan used this as motivation. So when the Bulls met Barkley's sons in the NBA Finals, they beat them in six. A six game series where Jordan would average 41 points, eight and a half rebounds, and six assists, and walk away with finals MVP. But during the 1993 playoffs, a controversy arose, where the night before a game versus the Knicks in the conference finals, Jordan was seen in Atlantic City in the middle of the night gambling. And after that, many stories came out of his gambling debts. After this controversy carried over to the offseason, Michael Jordan decided to retire at the age of 29. MJ listed his lack of desire to continue playing basketball as the reason that he retired, then later said it was the death of his father that made him want to quit playing basketball to pursue baseball. His father wanted Jordan to be a baseball player, and MJ hoped to fulfill his dad's wish. But the timing of this retirement with this major controversy sparked a massive conspiracy that the league suspended MJ, but disguised it as a retirement. The main point of emphasis for this conspiracy being this line that MJ said in his retirement press conference. Uh, five years down the line, if that urge comes back, if the Bulls have me, if, if David Stern lets me back in the league, I may come back. If David Stern lets me back in the league, I may come back. Regardless of why he retired, he did retire. He would play baseball for a year, and about midway through the 1994-95 season, Scottie Pippen invited Michael to a team practice, and the Bulls, who were struggling that season at 31-31, and convinced MJ to return to basketball. And MJ announced his return with a two-word press release, I'm back. Things were not storybook-like for his initial return, however. MJ only averaged 27 points on 41% shooting in his 17 games that season, and Scottie Scottie Pippen, who had been the main scoring option for a year and a half now, had to adjust to being dropped right back into his Robin role, after being the guy for over a year. Because of some adjustment struggles, the Bulls lost to the Orlando Magic, led by the young duo of Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway in a six-game series. The only playoff series Jordan would lose after surpassing the Pistons. But that somewhat failure that initially came with that series was more motivation for MJ, who trained like crazy in the 95 offseason. The Bulls added defensive and rebounding force Dennis Rodman in the offseason, and the Bulls started the season 41-3 and finished the season with an NBA record, at the time, 72-10 record. Jordan won his eighth scoring title, averaging 30 points per game, shot a career high from three, 43%. Granted, the three-point line was shortened for that season, and he would win his fourth MVP award. The Bulls would only lose three games all throughout the playoffs, beating the Sonics in the finals in six games, with Jordan winning finals MVP. Next season, the Bulls would win 69 games. MJ would lose out on the MVP award to Carl Malone and just like was the case with Barkley, stealing an MVP from Jordan proved to be a curse in the finals as Jordan and the Bulls would win in six games. This series had some particularly iconic moments from Jordan, including a game winner in game one, and the iconic flu game, where Jordan played with flu-like symptoms, scoring 38 points and hitting the game-deciding three. He would win his fifth finals MVP. And in Jordan's final season as a Bull, the team would win 62 games, Jordan would win yet another scoring title, averaging 29 points a game at the age of 34. He would win his fifth and final MVP, making it to the finals to face the Utah Jazz once again, beating them in six games, hitting the game winner at the end of game six. 17 seconds from game seven, or from championship number six. Jordan, open, Chicago with the lead! winning his sixth ring, sixth finals MVP, going out with an iconic shot being the last moment of his career. A storybook ending. But Jordan decided to ruin that storybook ending by adding some pretty mediocre and unnecessary chapters to the end by becoming a Washington Wizard. After a few years as partial owner and president of basketball operations for the Wizards, Jordan being so close to the game brought back his desire to play. So Michael Jordan at the age of 38 decided to return to basketball to play for the Wizards. 
In his first year, he averaged 23.6 rebounds and 5 assists, shooting 41% from the field. The Wizards would miss the playoffs, and in his last season, Jordan, from the ages of 39 to 40, would average 20 points per game on 45% shooting. He would finally retire for real at the end of the 2003 season. What's in the bag? Look, Big Mac fries. Play you for it. You and me for my Big Mac. First one to miss, what's as a winner eat? No dunking. <laughs> Floor, off the scoreboard, off the bank board, no rim. Over the second rafter, off the floor, nothing but net. Through the window, off the wall, nothing but net. What you want is what you get in the titles today. Off the expressway, over the river, off the billboard, through the window, off the wall, Nothing but that. Michael Jordan may have the most impressive resume of any candidate. Six championships, six finals MVPs, five regular season MVPs, he made the All-NBA first team ten times and second team once, he was All-Defensive first team nine times, won Defensive Player of the Year, being one of four guards to do so, he won Rookie of the Year and was a 14-time All-Star, winning the All-Star MVP three times. MJ was one of the most lethal scorers to ever play the game, his incredible athleticism allowed him to get to the basket at will, and his mid-range game was one of the best of all time. Off of the pull-up or out of the post, MJ could hit any type of mid-range jumper you gave him, and as a result, he won 10 scoring titles and he's 5th all-time in scoring. Defensively, Michael won Defensive Player of the Year as a guard. He's 2nd all-time in blocks amongst guards behind Dwayne Wade, and he's 3rd in steals. But those are the rankings he has having retired twice. With adjusted conservative numbers, had he not retired, Jordan would be first all-time in scoring with 40,000 plus points, 57th all-time in rebounds, making him second amongst guards behind Jason Kidd, he'd move up to second in steals, and he'd move up to 74th all-time in blocks, making him the only guard in the top 100. So these numbers are worth considering, just like Wilt and Russell's block numbers are worthy of consideration. Jordan's case for GOAT has to be the great combination of championships and individual accomplishments that he has. Most candidates have a high amount of one or the other. Wilt didn't win a lot of rings, but his individual accomplishments, both award-wise and statistically, are phenomenal. Whereas Russell has the most rings of all time, but his numbers and individual accolades aren't nearly as impressive. With MJ, he has all of the individual accolades, as well as six rings. He also never lost on the biggest stage, six for six in the NBA Finals. He also never played in a Game 7 in the Finals. MJ's Clutch factor and killer mentality is also one of the biggest arguments used for Jordan's case for GOAT. MJ was ultra competitive. He was known for wanting to not only beat his opponent, but destroy them. This competitive spirit led to MJ working harder than anyone, which is why he won so much. MJ won on the biggest stage without failure and stacked up other awards as well. But for the other side, Jordan did not win much until Scottie Pippen showed up, and he did not win until the Pistons and Celtics declined. He wasn't winning on the biggest stage until a path opened up for him to get there. There is also the argument that he had weak competition. While Jordan played with Pippen and Rodman for three years, both Hall of Famers, he never faced more than two prime Hall of Famers in the finals. James Worthy and Magic Johnson in 91, just Clyde Drexler in 92, just Charles Barkley in 93, Gary Payton and Sean Kemp in 96, and John Stockton and Carl Malone. And a lot of those players are not exactly the cream of the crop for Hall of Fame players. Other than Magic, none are commonly considered top 10 players of all time, and many were not even top 5 players in the league when they met Jordan in the finals. And MJ's perfect finals record may not have been so perfect had he not 
not retired. Hakeem always gave the Bulls problems because they never had a center that could come anywhere close to stopping him. There is also the argument that he did not have a lot of competition at his position. Clyde Drexler, Reggie Miller, Joe Dumars, and Mitch Richmond are the four best guards of the 90s below MJ, Clyde being the only real superstar at Jordan's position. So MJ had a large collection of individual and team accomplishments, but there are doubts about the competition in which Jordan achieved those things. In Jordan's last few seasons in Chicago, there was a lot of buzz around the league about a kid from Philadelphia who could be the second coming of MJ. That kid from Philly was none other than Kobe Bryant. In the 95-96 season, while Jordan and the Bulls were busy making history winning 72 games, there was a lot of buzz coming from Philly. Lower Marion High School was dominating high school ball, led by their senior shooting guard, Kobe Bryant. Bryant led Lower Marion to their first state championship in 53 years, averaging 30.8 points, 12 rebounds, 6.5 assists, 4 steals, and 3.8 blocks for the season. Kobe received national attention for his performance and received several awards. He was named the Naismith High School Player of the Year, Gatorade's National Player of the Year, he was a McDonald's All-American, and he was a USA Today's All-USA First Team Player. After taking Brandy to his senior prom, he then decided to skip college and go straight to the NBA. No, I have decided to skip college and take my talent to the NBA. Kobe was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets with the 13th overall pick, but Bryant had no interest in playing for Charlotte. He threatened them not to draft him, saying he would instead play in Italy, but Charlotte drafted him with the intention to trade him to the Lakers for center Vladi Divac. The Lakers moved Vlade to free up space to sign Shaquille O'Neal, a player that could have easily been in this documentary, and thus began what many people would call the greatest duo in NBA history. But it would take some time for this duo to succeed. Kobe wasn't a star day one like many other GOAT candidates. But that was the disadvantage of coming straight out of high school. Kobe took some time to adapt to the NBA 18 years of age. In his rookie season, he averaged only 7.6 points on 41.7% field goal percentage, but that was on only 15 minutes per game off of the bench. The Lakers had one of the best players in the league on their team and Shaq, so they were trying to win. So giving minutes to an 18-year-old wasn't their top priority. But Kobe did participate in and win the 1997 slam dunk contest. The player will attempt two dunks here on a rotating basis. So Kobe Kobe will dunk and then so will the other two. Then they'll do it one more time. Oh, oh between the legs! Kobe yeah. Bryant! Look at him. Yeah. Check him out. Check him out. <laughs> Check him out. In his second year, Kobe found himself with a more defined role on the team, with Coach Dell Harris giving Kobe more minutes and using him as a six-man, and Kobe could have easily won the Six Man of the Year award that season, averaging 15 points per game off of the bench, and being voted as an All-Star. Not really deservingly, because he made it from being a fan favorite, but an All-Star nonetheless. Next season, Kobe was finally given a starting job, averaging nearly 20 a game. His fourth season, though, was the real start of Bryant's career, and the start of the Lakers' amazing success. 
Kobe had career best averages of 22 points, 6.3 rebounds, and 4.9 assists on 46.8% field goal percentage, but more importantly, the Lakers were the best they had been post-Magic. This was due to Kobe's improvement, hiring Phil Jackson as the new head coach, and Shaq's MVP season, 29.7 points and 13.6 rebounds on 57% field goal percentage. The Lakers won 67 games and made it to the NBA Finals to face the Reggie Miller-led Indiana Pacers. Kobe struggled mightily in this series, his season average of 22 points per game dropped to 15, and his field goal percentage dropped by 10%, but Kobe was injured all throughout the series, after Jalen Rose intentionally injured him, but Kobe did have a serious contribution to this series. While he was bad for the series, in Game 4, Shaq fouled out in overtime. The Pacers were in prime position to tie the series up 2-2, and considering how badly the Lakers were blown out in Game 5, this game very well could have won the Pacers the series. But Bryant didn't let that happen. With two minutes left up one, a 21-year-old Kobe Bryant closed out the Pacers, scoring six points in OT, two tough jumpers over his defender. Three-point shooting, but Kobe is going to try to attack. Shaking on Miller, and hitting a two-point basket. He was just inside the line. and the game-deciding tip-in off of the Brian Shaw miss. Shaw, running one-hander, followed in by Kobe Bryant. Finishing with 28 for the game, but Shaq would obviously still win finals MVP with averages of 38 and 17. Next year, Kobe stepped up his game to another level, going from a star to a superstar. Playing with one of the most dominant offensive players in the NBA, Kobe still managed to average 28 a game alongside him, along with 6 rebounds and 5 assists. The Lakers won 56 games and went 15-1 and in the playoffs, only losing one game to a pissed-off Allen Iverson, and the Lakers would complete the 3 P in 2002. The Lakers would once again make it to the finals easily and play the Nets. They won in a sweep, but two of those games were closer than you'd think. Shaq won finals MVP once again, and it was all downhill from there. After the Lakers won their third straight championship, this is when the narrative of Kobe being carried by Shaq began. Kobe came into the league with the expectations of being the next MJ. Being Shaq's sidekick wasn't the role that people expected him to play. While Kobe was winning, he wasn't doing it as the guy. So the narrative began. Kobe wasn't okay with this. He also wasn't okay with Shaq's laziness. Kobe is known for his impeccable work ethic and asking a lot of his teammates. Shaq was more casual. He relied on his unbelievable size to dominate on the basketball court. He saw his size as all that he needed. Bryant wasn't happy about this, and he was constantly on Shaq's ass about it. This beef led to the Lakers losing to the Spurs in the 2003 playoffs. The Lakers would sign Karl Malone and Gary Payton in a desperate attempt to bring the team back to contention. Kobe would go through a court case in Denver where Shaq gave Kobe no support. The Lakers would make it to the finals again despite their differences, but would lose to a far less talented Pistons team, but also a far more cohesive Pistons team where the players didn't hate each other. Due to money reasons and his beef with Kobe, Shaq would demand a trade and be sent to Miami for Karan Butler and Lamar Odom. This would begin a span of years where Kobe would see a lot of individual success, but the Lakers would see no success. In three seasons, 2004 through 2007, Kobe would average 31.8 points combined throughout those three seasons, as well as 5.6 rebounds and 5.3 assists. And despite his insane usage, he still shot a very respectable 45% from the field and 34.4% three-point percentage. In his second season without Shaq, Kobe would average an absurd 35.4 points per game. This all was for nothing though, as the Lakers would miss the playoffs in 2005, lose after going up 3-1 to the Suns in the first round in 2006, and be gentlemen swept by the Suns in the first round in 2007. But this really wasn't Kobe's fault. After Shaq was traded, many of the Lakers players retired or left in free agency. Karan Butler wasn't quite at an all-star level yet and would leave after one season with the Lakers, only averaging 15 a game. And the Lakers saw players like Smush Parker, Luke Walton, and Kwame Brown consistently in their starting lineups. To be blunt, Kobe had no help. No player, no matter how great, was winning anything with what he had. This is why Kobe would demand a trade after losing to the Suns in 2007. You're still under contract with them. Are you saying right here on this show that you want to be traded? Yeah, I would, I would like to be traded, yeah. 
There's no, there's no if ands or buts about it. It's not a situation where what, what, if, what, if, what if, you know. I know before you reportedly said that you would like them to get Jerry West back. Are you saying now emphatically, regardless of what they've done, you want out of Los Angeles? Yeah, I would like to be traded. As tough as it is to say that, as tough as it is to, to come to that conclusion, um, you know, there's no other, there's no other, there's no other alternative. But despite some great offers, the Lakers would not trade Kobe. He would start the 2007-2008 season, putting the Lakers on pace for 50 wins. Then they would get Pau Gasol on top of that, only having to give up Pau's brother Mark, who was a second round pick, Kwame Brown, two scrubs, and two first round picks. The Lakers would win 57 games, Kobe would win his first and only MVP, beat the Spurs 4-1 in the conference finals, but they would lose to the Boston Celtics in the finals. Kobe would average 25-5-5 for the series, but he shot a very poor field goal percentage at just 40%. This loss was what Kobe would call his darkest time as a player. But Kobe and the Lakers would bounce back. They made their way to the finals once again, but unfortunately wouldn't face the Celtics. Instead, the Dwight Howard-led Orlando Magic. But luckily for the Lakers, this team was fairly inexperienced and the Lakers were able to beat them in five games. Kobe would win finals MVP, averaging 32 points and seven assists per game. Kobe was finally going to get his chance at the Celtics next season though. The Lakers would two-peat beating the Celtics in seven games. Kobe won finals MVP, averaging 28.6 points points, 8 rebounds, and 3.9 assists. He did shoot 40% from the field, but everyone on both teams struggled from the field. The Lakers as a whole shot just 41%. With these two championships, Kobe had proven that he could win without Shaq, and he got revenge on the Celtics. This would be the peak of Bryant's career. Next season, the Lakers would be swept in the playoffs by the Dallas Mavericks. The Lakers would trade for Chris Paul, but the trade would be quickly vetoed by the league. Then they would trade for Dwight Howard, which unfortunately wasn't vetoed by the league. Kobe would end the 2013 season by tearing his Achilles and with this look on his face he knew it everyone on the court and in the stands knew it and everyone at home watching knew it this was the last time we would see Kobe as an elite player he played two more seasons and retired in 2016 Jalen oh no hey Hey, Cole, how you doing? How retirement treating you? It's great, man. It's great. Just, uh, you know, a little writing, a little investing. Nice. So I don't know if you saw the thing on Twitter about your statue. Uh, you know, I don't pay attention to that stuff. Man. Yeah, I figured that. Me either. A drink, Mr. Bryant? Yeah, I'll have a, uh, a, a vodka martini. How many olives would you like? 81. Really? <laughs> nah, man, I'm just playing. Just two joke for him. He gets it. Kobe won five championships in his career, one MVP and two finals MVPs. He made the All-NBA first team 11 times, second team twice, and third team twice. He was All-Defensive first team nine times and second team three times. And he was an 18-time All-Star, winning All-Star MVP four times. Like Jordan, he was a phenomenal scorer and perimeter defender, and Kobe had the killer instinct that he would brand as the Mamba mentality that MJ did. He was also arguably arguably the hardest working player in NBA history. Jordan certainly worked hard, but he would also party and gamble a lot. Kobe was all business, basketball was his one and only focus, and it could be argued that Kobe earned his success more than any other player. A guy like Wilt was known for being lazy off of the court, but he was blessed with being 7 foot 1. Kobe was of average height by NBA standards, but he worked his ass off to become one of the most lethal scores the league had ever seen, as well as one of the better defenders the league had ever seen. There is also an argument to be made that Kobe was robbed of an MVP or two. In the 2006 and 2007 season, where Kobe averaged 35 and 32 points, the MVP went to Steve Nash and Dirk Nowitzki. And in the 2003 season, Kobe averaged 37, 6, and 2 on good efficiency, but lost out to Tim Duncan because Bryant had more help. But Kobe definitely had a case for those three MVPs where he came 
came up short. While Kobe does have five rings, there are a lot of questions about the legitimacy of them. While no one can take away his last two rings, many believe that Kobe was carried by Shaq, or at the very least feel him not being the best player on his team for three rings lowers the value of them for his legacy. The counterpoint to that would be any player alongside Shaq in the early 2000s would not have been the best player on the team, or at the very least wouldn't have been the finals MVP. Shaq in the 2000s consistently matched up against centers who couldn't come close to handling him in the post. Shaq was such a dominant force that there was no stopping him. Even Dikembe Mutombo was dominated down low because even though he was a great shot blocker, he didn't have the strength or stamina to contain him inside. Offensively, giving the ball to Shaq in the early 2000s was the best play in basketball, a better play than a Kobe isolation or even a Jordan isolation, a LeBron pick and roll, or a Larry Bird three-pointer. The point being, winning finals MVP next to Shaq was next to impossible. Bryant performed at finals MVP levels for two out of those three championships, being injured in 2000. He averaged 25, 8, and 6 in 2001, and 27, 6, and 5 on 51% shooting in 2002. Those are finals MVP level stats. Shaq just so happened to average 33, 16, 5 assists, and 4.5 blocks in 2001, and 26, 12, and 3 in 2002. There was no winning finals MVP for Kobe playing alongside Shaq. But at the same time, that also means that Kobe was playing with the best player in the league for three years, so that certainly better help than anyone else on this list. So Kobe was one of the hardest workers ever, one of the best scorers ever, but he fell short on the MVP ladder many times, and he wasn't the best player for three out of his five championships. Through Kobe's reign in the NBA, there was only one player who was also constantly in the conversation for best player in the NBA over Kobe, and that player was Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan had a very interesting start to his basketball career. He didn't follow the traditional path. He originally started off his career as an athlete trying to become an Olympic swimmer. But after Hurricane Hugo destroyed the only Olympic-sized pool in St. Crocs, which was the Virgin Island Duncan lived on, Tim had to practice swimming in the ocean. But he wasn't too big of a fan of that because one, beach conditions aren't the same as an Olympic swimming pool, and two, Duncan had a serious fear of sharks. So this led to Duncan losing his passion for swimming and switching over to basketball. He played for his high school and really struggled a lot initially. Though he was really tall, he picked up the game a lot later in life than most. But after a few seasons, he started in his senior year averaging 25 a game. He wasn't recruited by big schools like Duke or Kentucky, but he did get a scholarship with Wake Forest. Duncan's lack of flash but incredible reliability was established early with Wake Forest, and he had a great freshman campaign but it was his sophomore season where Duncan would establish himself as a top-tier prospect. He led the Deacons to an ACC championship. Duncan that season averaged 17 points, 12 rebounds, and 4 blocks. He was All-ACC First Team and Defensive Player of the Year. In his junior season, he averaged 19-12, and 12, was once again Defensive Player of the Year as well as the ACC Player of the Year. The Deacons won the ACC title, but in the Sweet 16, Duncan caught the flu, and they lost one game from the Final Four. In his senior year, he he'd averaged 21 points, 15 rebounds, and 3.3 blocks on 60% shooting. He won the John Wooden Award and was the Naismith College Player of the Year. However, the Deacons failed to win the third straight ACC title. The San Antonio Spurs would take Tim Duncan first overall in the 1997 draft. Just like Magic Johnson, Duncan was drafted into a uniquely great situation. With Magic, the Lakers lucked into a great pick from a trade made years before drafting Magic. For the Spurs, David Robinson, their superstar center went down with an injury that kept them out for the entire season. So the team was really bad for the 96-97 season and ended up with the first pick. Duncan joining the Admiral, creating the Twin Towers. Having two athletic defensive superstar big men down low meant the paint was locked down. Duncan as a rookie averaged 21 points, 12 rebounds, and 2.5 and blocks. He was an all-star, all-NBA first team, and made the all-NBA defensive second team, and he won rookie of the year. The Spurs would make it 
into the second round of the playoffs, losing to the Carl Malone John Stockton Jazz. In his sophomore season, Duncan would put up similar stats to his rookie year, but he would establish himself as the best player on the team. The Spurs would see a lot more success with this change. The Spurs would make it to the NBA Finals and face, admittingly, a fairly easy opponent. They faced the 8th seed in Knicks, the only 8th seed to ever make the NBA Finals, a team led by Latrell Sprewell and Allen Houston. The Spurs would win in 5 games, with Duncan averaging 27, 14, and 2 blocks on 54% shooting, winning Finals MVP in just his second season. In his third year, Duncan bumped up his averages a bit, but got injured before the postseason and didn't get to play in the playoffs. Next year, he maintained similar averages, was All-NBA First Team and Defensive First Team, but the Spurs would lose to the Kobe and Shaq Lakers in a sweep. In the offseason, restricted free agency had not yet been implemented during the collective bargaining agreement, and Duncan strongly considered signing with the Orlando Magic, who had laid out a plan in free agency to add Tracy McGrady, Grant Hill, and Duncan. The Spurs were really lacking in talent besides for Duncan, as Robinson was 36. The Magic were offering a chance to dominate a weak Eastern Conference and be a legit competitor with the Lakers, who looked unbeatable in the Western Conference. Duncan was very close to signing, and even told Greg Popovich that he would sign with the Magic. But because of small details, like Magic coach Doc Rivers telling Duncan he couldn't have his family on the team plane, Duncan decided to stay with the Spurs. His fifth year would be the best statistical year of his career. He averaged 25.5 points, 13 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2.5 blocks. He would win his first MVP, but upon matching up with the Lakers again, the Spurs would lose in 5 games. David Robinson was aging, and he could not handle Shaq in the post. And Tony Parker wasn't able to be a big contributor yet, being a rookie. Duncan was pretty much on his own. He'd win MVP back-to-back -back in the 02-03 season, averaging 23-13-4 assists and 3 blocks on 51% shooting. The Spurs would win 60 games despite Duncan having little help. Tony Parker was a 15-point-per-game scorer. Manu was a rookie. David Robinson was playing his last year. Steven Jackson was very inefficient. And Bruce Bowen was pretty much just a 3-and-D guy. Duncan was very much carrying this team. Despite the regular season success, Duncan and the Spurs would have to surpass the hurdle that was the Lakers. Again, Duncan would find himself carrying the load. He led the team in points, rebounds, assists, and was third in field goal percentage despite taking 40 more shots than the next in line. He also was often the guy who had to guard Shaq. He averaged 28-12-5 and five on 53% shooting, and the Spurs would beat the Kobe Shaq Lakers in six games, Duncan closing out game six with 37 points and 16 rebounds. Duncan single-handedly beat one of the greatest duos ever, beef or no, it was one of the most impressive feats of his career. The Spurs would beat the Mavericks in the conference finals in a series where Duncan would average 28 points, 17 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3 blocks. And in the finals, matched up against the New Jersey Nets, Duncan would average 24, 17, 5 assists, and 5 blocks. And in game 6, he would nearly put up a quadruple double, putting up 21 points, 20 rebounds, 10 assists, and 8 blocks. David Robinson also put up 17 rebounds in his final game. Duncan would be named Finals MVP. Next year, the Spurs would lose to the Lakers in a tough series, where the Lakers would turn the tides in Game 5. Duncan hit an impossible shot to take the lead. To Duncan. He gets doubled. Shaq all over. He gets away a fadeaway. He makes it with four tenths left. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But Derek Fisher would hit an impossible shot with .4 seconds remaining. Here they go. They get it to Fisher. He scores! Derek Fisher scores at the buzzer! Now, this shot was pretty much impossible for Fisher to get off in .4 seconds, but the league allowed it despite the Spurs filing an appeal. Duncan would fall off a bit statistically in the 04-05 season, but Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili would both average 16 points a game, with Parker averaging 6 assists a game, and Bruce Bowen was still locking down on defense and shooting 40% from 3. The Spurs made it to the finals with a more refined team, and they would beat the team that formerly beat the Lakers in the finals, the Detroit Pistons,
wins in a seven game series. Duncan averaged 20, 14, and 2, and Ginobili contributed 19, 6, and 4 for the series. Duncan shot poorly from the field being guarded by Ben Wallace, a four time defensive player of the year, but he still won the finals MVP. In the following postseason, the Mavericks would beat the Spurs in seven games, only winning game seven by eight points. Dirk and Duncan had a hell of a battle. Duncan averaged 32, 12, and two and a half blocks, and Dirk averaged 27 and 13, but Dirk ultimately had more help on his team. In 2007, the Spurs only lost four games all throughout the playoffs, sweeping LeBron's Cavaliers in the finals, but Duncan would not be named finals MVP as it went to Tony Parker, who averaged 24 and a half points on 57% shooting. But after this, Duncan and the Spurs would go through six years of playoff disappointment, losing 4-1 to the Lakers in the conference finals, losing 4-1 to the Mavs, 4-2 to the Mavs, 4-2 to the Grizzlies, 4-2 to the OKC Thunder, and in 2013, the Spurs would make it to the NBA Finals, but as we know, the Spurs had the series all but one in Game 6, but Ray Allen would hit potentially the greatest shot in basketball history. James catches, puts up the three, won't go, rebound box, back out to Allen, history point of bang! After this crushing loss, the Spurs were motivated to come back and get revenge. By this point, the Spurs were no longer a team built around Duncan. Instead, they were a team with no clear best player, guys who knew their role and played it well, and they had potentially the greatest ball movement of any team ever. The Spurs started the playoffs off rough, barely beating the 8th seed in Mavericks in 7 games. But they gentlemen swept the Blazers in the second round and beat OKC in 6 games where Duncan averaged 18 and 10. In the final Duncan would average 15 and 10, and the Spurs would manhandle the Miami Heat. Dwayne Wade was on his last legs, or more accurately, his last knees, and LeBron was pretty much on his own, and it didn't help that 22-year-old Spur Kawhi Leonard stepped up his game, played great defense, and averaged 18 points and 6 rebounds on 61% shooting. With those numbers, Kawhi of course won Finals MVP over Tim Duncan, but Duncan got his fifth and final championship. Duncan would play two more uneventful seasons and retire at the age of 39. Are you excited that the week of greatness is back at Foot Locker? A week of the sickest releases. Everyone's excited about it. Man, that is exciting. T. Rose, I know it's crazy, right? I gotta call Tim. Tim Duncan. Yo, Tim. The week of greatness is back at Foot Locker. No way. That's insane. I'm bouncing off the wall. He never gets this excited. I can't contain myself. I just knocked over a plant celebrating. Tim Duncan was a textbook team player and winner. Five championships in three different decades, winning them in different roles. In 99, he was a budding young superstar surrounded by veteran talent. In 2003 and 2005, he was now the veteran star player, carrying a team of young guys. In 2007, he was still the best player on the team, but he was more than happy to share the spotlight with Parker and Manu. And in 2014, he was the old wise veteran player, that still contributed on the court, but more than anything, he was just an amazing leader. Tim Duncan, more than any other candidate besides for maybe Bill Russell, did not care what he had to do. All he cared about doing was winning. If he had to step down his role in the offense, he was happy to do it if that's what was required to win. If he had to be a dominant player and lockdown defender, he would do that for you. Tim Duncan was an unselfish winner. Though it wasn't important to him for his individual accolades. He was a two-time MVP, three-time Finals MVP. He made 10 All-NBA first teams, was second team three times and third team twice, All-Defensive first team eight times and second team seven times. He won Rookie of the Year and was a 15-time All-Star winning MVP once. Winning at every stage of his career and sacrificing some of his stats along the way is Duncan's biggest case for GOAT. After all, basketball is a team sport, and again, besides for Russell, 
Russell, no other player at Duncan's level was that unselfish. But on the flip side, some would argue that to be truly great, you need to win without sacrificing your individual greatness. And it's not a great sign that one of the ways that the Spurs continued dominating was by giving Duncan less of a role in the offense. And because of these sacrifices that Duncan often made, his statistics do not shine on the level of most of the candidates. So while Duncan was impressive as a winner, his statistics are lacking because of the sacrifices that he made, while in comparison, many other greats won just as much while maintaining their individual accolades.